A real pleasure to introduce Greg Pascarelli tonight as the um, Thomas Jefferson Professor. Um, oops, right, I don't have a mic here this time. Um, as the Thomas Jefferson Professor uh, this spring, um, he's here teaching with the um, and with others from shop. I'll make a longer introduction in just a second. Um, with the 7020 studios, so he's going to be coming off of about five hours of desk grits uh, for this lecture, but we have a history here of inviting people down, work them till they're just puddles on the floor, and then put them back on a plane and send them to wherever they came from. Uh, but uh, Greg has a great energy and spirit, and so we're uh, looking forward to um, a terrific lecture tonight. Greg is not a stranger to UVA. Um, he was the Shore professor in 2003, um, which was the first year I was chair last time around. Um, so that doesn't mean that you have to wait till I'm chair again for a third time, because it's not going to happen. Um, so we need to um, bring you back on a regular basis. But it's fantastic, because you know it's interesting. Between 2003 and now, um, SHOP has transformed from really an incredibly promising, productive, already transforming the world kind of startup in some ways to one that is now really at the top of the field in architecture, but continuing to transform and to uh, reinvent the discipline. Uh, last time we uh, that Greg was here. We had a conversation, and he talked a little bit in his lecture, and I hope I'm not stealing his thunder here, but that um, he came into architecture, and this I was particularly directed toward the students and also those of you who studied something other than architecture as undergrads. Um, his undergrad degree is Bachelor of Science in Business from Villanova, and he and um, other principals of uh, shop came together and had a background then that didn't actually come to the discipline through all of the expected structures of what the profession is supposed to look like and how this discipline is supposed to be practiced, which is incredibly liberating when you think about it, that they, instead of picking up on this, you know, basically 100-year-old structure that is actually pretty constraining about how architects can operate in the world and say, we don't need to think about the discipline from those boundaries. We can actually open up and start working in a very different way. We can start breaking down the boundary between the architect, the contractor, the developer, the, the urban planner, all of these different dim dimensions of the working in the built environment that uh, architects, in a way, have been constrained um, historically. And again, in, it's only in very recent times. I mean, you think about the structure of the discipline, the, as the profession as we know it, it, it was really only a late 19th century invention. So it's something that is actually ripe for reinvention. The combination of new technologies, the combination of that with um, whole new forms of communication, modes of production, modes of fabrication opened up a completely different territory for, for architects to be operating in. It's something that in some ways we take a little bit for granted. We talk about these workflows that move from design to uh, the, um, into uh, fabrication and figuring out how these things can be relatively seamless operations. But in the late 90s and early 2000s, this was actually breaking territory, new territory wide open. And SHOP was really instrumental in changing that landscape for practitioners, uh, re opening up new territory for ways of practicing. And this was, um, and so, you know, we were very fortunate uh, to have them here then. Since then, it's one of those stories that you could say, you know, the rest is, is history. Things have not slowed down at all. So I'm just going to pull out these guys and, um, just read a couple of short excerpts here um, just to do my due diligence as um, making sure I set the stage properly. That as a founding principal of SHOP, Greg um, has been the center of the collaborative practice for nearly 20 years, leading teams in design, master planning, real estate development. He has a thorough fami familiarity working in complex urban contexts to create dynamic projects that transform their communities. Um, he's been the lead partner on many of the firm's most prominent projects, um, and I think we'll see a number of these um, here 
tonight that include the Porter House, Barclays Center, um, the East River Waterfront, um, 111 West 57th Street, um, uh, American Copper Buildings, Pier 17. And he, but the work is way beyond New York and way beyond the U.S. It's uh, global um, with Fulbright University in Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and projects in Africa and around the world. So it has expanded in scope. We were talking, I was visiting the office earlier, um, the number of high-rise buildings taller than the Empire State Building that really sets a completely different set of parameters that uh, for how we think about practice um, and many larger practices, hopefully, uh, in the works um, as wait for that. He's taught at Yale, Columbia, UVA, Syracuse, Florida, a number of uh, universities, and SHOP has won just about every award conceivable. But uh, I think Fast Company's most innovative architecture firm in the world a few years ago is a really good one to kind of sum up the impact that they've had um, on the profession and beyond. And that's one of the things that I think is um, something for us to really think about as architects and as practitioners um, uh, in a discipline that in a way is being recognized more and more as having something to offer uh, the world that is, yes, grounded in the production of buildings, but in thinking about, maybe perhaps think about that more in human habitats and everything that's designed within that space, really uh, changing the, the territory that, operate, that, that architects operate in. And that is um, both empowering um, and, and inspiring. So uh, for, again, for the students, if there seems to be an expanded sense of possibilities, sometimes a set of questions about where the boundaries of the discipline are, and um, a sense that there are many different possible paths that you can make your way in as you go into the future. Um, Greg is one of the key people who made all that kind of thinking possible, so you can thank him for your confusion. Um, and <laughs> on that note, I will introduce Greg to give us a talk uh, that I gather is going to actually cover quite a wide spectrum of your work over the years, which is terrific. So, thanks. Um, thank you, Bill, very much. Um, it's really, it is great to be here. Um, there are so many familiar faces and friends and, and new friends and um, teaching with, uh, with Mona and um, Matthew and Seth has been wonderful. Thank you for making me feel so at home. It's great to see Karen. It's great to see Isla and, and everyone else, Julie. Um, so I'm really just very honored to be here. Um, I do love the school. I, we've been working on this. I, I can't show it yet. There's like so much stuff I'm not allowed to show, unfortunately. But um, uh, we've been working on this university for a year, a brand new campus from the ground up for the Fulbright Institute in Ho Chi Minh. And so we've really, we've spent a year just doing pure research on, on, on campus designs. And um, so I've spent a lot of time walking around the grounds of UVA the last year um, just because it's such a fabulous model. Um, in my head, and so it's really nice to be here um, and, and see it uh, in, in full. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to just talk about CHOP, how we started as a small firm, the kinds of work that we do and the way that we like to think about architecture. I'm going to go really fast, um, and I'm happy to answer some questions at the end. But we might want to drop the lights. Um, just taking on what Bill had said uh, at the beginning, um, you know, this is, let's say, the last 150 years of, of, of architectural practice, the sort of history. And when we were in school, there was this huge division between sort of the paper architects and the service architects, the kind of people that were thinking and challenging and really uh, doing conceptual ideas and, and pushing those boundaries. And then there were the people that could actually figure out how to build them and they wouldn't leak. And we were really kind of concerned with the profession as a whole that there would be this sort of division. And so we came together when we were all students at Columbia where we were super interested. You know, we, we, we all taught, we've written, we care about um, theory and academia. It's unbelievably important, but we were equally interested in being makers and that we actually thought that the more that we sort of went in the other camp, it was a some kind of Newtonian uh, a law that, that helped us in the opposite side of things. And so this notion of being a thinker and a maker at the same time was really important to us. Isn't that funny? It, it flipped again. 
So there's a weird, there's a strange uh, virus between my presentation and UVA's computer that converts some of the, the text into these, but I think we'll be okay. Um, um, so I, it's never, I, it's probably my 300th lecture, and it's, this is the only school it's happened that, and it's happened, and it's happened twice, so. Um, but I think that the, the thing is that we, we don't really come at a building from a kind of aesthetic style. We, we, we don't have a, a brand in that sense. I mean, obviously, we, it's our hand, it's our eye, it's what our, we think is beautiful and what we like to play with, but it's really about asking questions. And that's how we approach every project with this sort of series of questions. Um, but we've, as we said, we've always been super interested in, in beauty and ornament and material, but equally interested in what's right behind it and how it gets put together. And using technology at the forefront of being able to push those, those ideas of making and materiality and research into, into our buildings. And very early on, we were also incredibly interested in, in what do architects do? They don't build buildings. They build instruct. They make instruction sets for other people to build buildings, and so really, it's kind of how do we draw these things? How do we draw? Is plan section and elevation actually the best system to communicate what we do? And we don't think it is, in fact. And I think that there's a lot more that we we should be doing in the way that we're drawing, in the way that we're producing these instruction sets, and the way that we're communicating around the world. So. These are some drawings from a very early project at Camera Obscura, which was basically the first kind of BIM project before there was BIM, BIM version 0 0.1, if you will, where we just manually did it before Revit existed um, to make a building. Or, or in some of our very early work, like the project we did at PS1 MoMA, where that was the complete uh, construction document set to build a pavilion in three weeks uh, in the courtyard at PS1. Um, where it was really about uh, a method of fabrication, of structure, of making a space and a kind of performance of a beach, um, where we started to think about the idea of surface structure and performance or a program kind of blending into a single thickness, you know, where, where pieces went from a, a structural uh, uh, truss from a bench into a wall into a space and then the kinds of impacts it would have on the institutions where it was placed. Um, this was the sort of first one that was done um, after to start the, the PS1 uh, Young Architects Prize and really sort of had a huge impact on the museum. And, you know, so if, 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 if mathematics is sort of the, 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 the common ground between art and science, we see all three of those going to design. Um, but for SHOP, what we really thought of these other elements, politics, finance, social responsibility, theory, technology, these are things that we think of equally and that design filters through those in order to become architecture. And, you know, and, and so what does that mean? What does that mean to sort of take on all these other elements that aren't traditionally the role of the architect? But, and, and it really kind of leads us back to being the master builder. But what does it mean to be the master builder today? And the first, uh, the first time, so that says the porterhouse, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll do interpretations, you know, hand language. So. Um, uh, so the first time we were ever able to kind of blend those all together was this small 50,000 foot building we did down in the meatpacking district where we found a, a, a 1905 warehouse. We developed, we kind of negotiated an air rights transfer we had to think of a very inexpensive way to cantilever because we were hemmed in by the zoning envelope on, <coughs> on uh, four of our sides and um, had to go horizontally in order to control the property and, and think about how to do the new structural system with a two-story Verindale truss. And, and this was the first time that we actually had taken on uh, an equity position in, in the project. So we were a partner with the developer because we put it all together and we determined how to sort of crack the anomalies of the zoning code and make a new kind of building. And so we restored this historic warehouse below and then we did this contemporary box on top and um, we developed the system. It was a rain screen system. It was the first time a rain screen had, screen had been used in New York. Um, it was the first building where all 4,000 panels of the facade were, were cut by a, by a plasma cutter and done digitally uh, without any shop drawings. 4,000 pieces were made. They were all delivered. There were codes that were actually laser cut right into the facade itself. 
And so the architectural uh, sort of ornament of the building was the instruction set to put it together in and of itself. Uh, we built it without a facade manufacturer. We actually developed the facade. We hired roofers to do the waterproofing. We hired carpenters to install them. We were up there and we, we started without any drawings. We started at one corner. We put 4,000 panels on. We came around to the side and we were 1 32nd of an inch off and brought it in for half of the amount that every other facade uh, builder had done. And um, it created a sort of icon. I, my thing that I'm most proud about this building is it won both architectural design awards and preservation awards, um, which there, it's not too often that they can do both. Um, and then uh, shortly after this, Google bought that building behind it. And Larry and Sergey loved the building so much that that was how they called us to come work for, for Google in the future. Um, so it really had a huge impact. And we developed this as a, as a condominium project. It was 22 units. And, and we did the building. We did the marketing materials. We brought it to the market. We, we sold it. And one of my favorite things about this building, and I've told the story before, but I think what makes it work on that, on that metal facade is the depth that's uh, by pushing the, the glass, uh, the windows in 14 inches, it really creates this great pattern of light and shadow. And, and I mean, just as a way that we kind of solve problems, you know, we thought, oh gosh, that's going to create ledges everywhere, and and we have a pigeon issue in New York City. So what do we do about that? So um, we called the Museum of Natural History, and we asked, was there an angle of repose that a pigeon did not like to sit on? And they said, yes, it's 34 degrees. And so I don't know how they knew that. So we designed every. Um, <laughs> This is actually a drawing from the construction documents. We designed these 34 degree sort of ledges on the front of every, uh, of every window. And it's fantastic because now 15 years later and there's not one bird shit on the entire facade. So <laughs> it worked out pretty well. Um, and, but the interesting thing about that project was the, cr the amazing amount of risk that we took to do it. And it was only because we got involved in the financial side and the political side in the, in the fabrication and the means and methods, all the things the AIA documents tell you not to do, we did not listen to. And we built this 50,000 foot building, we brought it to market, it sold very well, and only about six years later, we were approached with a slightly more complicated project, which was the billion dollar Barclay Center, which was, uh, had 34 lawsuits levied against it, it was in 10 years of battle, and it had come in over budget, and it was the middle of the, uh, of the global financial crash. And um, for some of you, you may know that this was originally a Frank Geary design, um, which was a really uh, brilliant design for a stadium in a city. Um, the Geary design was sort of four big towers with foundations that held the bowl in the middle. And so therefore, the, the, base, of the, the base of the buildings obscured the, the facade of the stadium which is actually a very smart way to deal with a, a stadium in an urban neighborhood because they're not particularly great neighbors. Um, the press always gets it wrong. They say that they couldn't afford to build the Frank Geary design. That was not what happened. What happened was the four spec buildings that were going to be built could not get financing in 2008 and 2009 after the crash. And so the buildings had to, it couldn't be built all together, the, the stadium with the four towers at the same time stadium had to be built as a standalone object. So um, uh, Bruce Ratner, our client, who loved working with Frank, he did the um, 8 Spruce Street Tower in Manhattan with him, you know, said, well, we have to redesign it as a standalone building. Um, Frank said, well, that's fine. I it's going to take 18 months to two years to do the drawing set, which is what it would take. But the problem was, if you weren't in the ground with the building, with your foundations uh, in, by the end of 2009, a, st a stadium bond financing was no longer going to be tax deductible, and it would have been a $400 million hit to the project and probably would have taken the client's company down. So this was March, and they had to have a new stadium design and be in the ground by December 31st. <laughs> so um, what they did was they went to Hunt Construction, who is the biggest design build contractor of, of NBA arenas, they went in the plane, they went to all 12 arenas that they did, and they said, if you like one and it fits on the site, we have the drawings and we can order the steel and you have a 50-50 shot of getting it done. So what they did was there was a, 
Conseco Fieldhouse in Indianapolis was the one that they liked the most. It was um, an Ellerby Beckett design, and it fit on the site in Brooklyn. And they ordered the they ordered the steel, and um, and then they went back to Mayor Bloomberg and Amanda Burden, our mayor and head of Depar Department of City Planning, and said, "Oh, by the way, it, we can't do a Frank Gehry building. We have to do this." And the city was not happy. They felt like they were baited and switched. And somehow after that meeting, this image ended up on the front page of the New York Times the next day, and, uh, and everything got a little bit crazy. So uh, about a month later, we got a phone call uh, from Bruce Ratner, who I didn't know. Um, and he said, do you think you can help me? Do you he said, I'm Bruce Ratner. Do you know who I am? Yes. He said, do you know what my problem is? <laughs> they said, I assume you're talking about Atlantic Yards. He said, yes. he said can you, I've been told you're the, you can come up with a problem to fix it. So a solution to, to fix it. <laughs> I did come up with several problems, so that's another story. Um, and so uh, we, we turned down the project because we didn't know that he had already ordered the steel. And we had a great five-hour meeting, but I, we were like, we're not doing a skin job on your building. Like, that's not what we do. Um, he said, I would like you, if you phrased it more as you were going to design a couture dress, and uh, my partner, Chris Sharpless, said, yeah, but I've seen your budget, and you can only afford a leotard, so it's not going to work out. <laughs> so we turned it down, but we had a great time. And then that night, we went out, and the proverbial napkin sketch occurred. And this was the sketch where we came out with one idea for the, for the arena. Um, my favorite part about this drawing is it says Toyo Ito on it, but nobody remembers talking about Toyo Ito, and we have no idea what this building has to do with Toyo Ito, but by the third martini, it all seemed like a great idea. Um, so we called them the next day, and they, we said, give us five days to, we'll produce one image, and if you like the image, then we'll come in and we'll, we want, we, we not only want the facade, but we want the interiors, we want all the public space, and we want the first three towers. And they said, okay, let's see if you can do that. So the idea was to take this vertically oriented arena, cut it up into hor horizontal bands of solid and void, and to align the concourse on the inside with the sidewalk on the outside so that there was always a kind of active relationship between the two, to have the first band sort of relate to the five-story fabric of, of Brooklyn, and then to open up the upper concourse to look out over the sky and have a kind of upper halo that sort of sat on the, on the skyline as a, as a kind of object. And it was really about opening up the views uh, to go in and out um, and to really connect from inside. The st most, most arenas are really internally focused, but this was one that would really be about connecting to outside. And then because there was no tower in the front, there was this large public plaza, and so we felt like we needed to make this urban gesture that sort of, uh, you know, uh, made the building connect with the public space and with the, with the arena. So we've been calling it sort of our Arms of Bernini hip-hop style for, for Brooklyn. And then we, uh, there was a proposed uh, subway tunnel that brought nine subway lines onto the plaza. And the idea was that, as you're, that we wanted to prioritize the arrival experience for those coming by public transportation over those coming by private transportation. This is the first arena ever built with zero parking spots. And we said, if you don't want to come by car, if you don't want to come by subway, you should have a miserable time getting here, but you should be coming by public transportation. We don't care. <clears throat> and then from the plaza, we really opened up the VOM so that you could see right into the bowl and see the scoreboard from outside. And so five days later, this was the image that we sent to them. And, um, and only because they were, you know, we were still a pretty small firm, maybe, maybe only 40 or 50 people. And, and they were looking at us and, and, you know, we'd never done a big project, but we went through the drawings on the Porter House and we showed them how we solved that problem, how we had made a facade and didn't follow any rules and how it was successful. And that was the only reason they gave us the project. So if we hadn't understood the finance, if we hadn't understood the politics, if we hadn't gotten involved in the means and methods on this little project, we never get that commission only six months later for a project 22 times the size. And so we were given seven weeks to detail it. John Cerrone, who I'm co-teaching with, who's here, was the man who really worked on figuring all this out. Um, but we figured out how to make 
11,600 different shaped panels of core 10 steel and hang them on the outside of the building and create this. And we had to redesign the whole building, uh, detail it, cost it, and bring it in under a delta in seven weeks um, or we would be fired. Um, that was not a fun summer. Um, and 36 months later, that was the project as it got built on time and on budget, which was kind of amazing to do. But I, I love just seeing that it went from that to that to that. Um, so then here you could see John leading the team in, in Katia for the unfold of the panels, the whole sort of strut system that holds it from the enclosure, the weather enclosure, out to the, the panels. We produced all of the fabrication tickets in-house. We joint ventured with the facade manufacturer, helped them set up this factory in, um, um, in the Midwest where we collected rainwater from the roof. We hung the panels on a dry cleaner's rack. They went through 15 wet dry cycles a day for four months to put 10 years of patina on each one. Here they are in the dry cycle. We tagged every single one. We wrote our own iPhone app that tracked the entire process of, of uh, design, fabrication, uh, weathering, assembly, and delivery to Brooklyn. And the panels were designed to be exactly the size of what fits on a truck that can get into the city without a special permit. The panels, there were 960 or something, 900, something like that, 900 mega panels that went on the building. And, uh, and then here you could see the facade and the patterning and the folds that went inside. Um, and then the building as it sits in its context. You know, we thought about the material a lot. It was, it was a kind of a contemporary building, but with a kind of gritty industrial connection to, to Brooklyn. Here you could see the Oculus where we put the digital board on the inside. Here's everyone coming out of the subway and right into the arena. Um, the lighting on the facade at night, which is just a, a marine fluorescent that bounces off of the folded piece. And then the, the struts that came inside and became the lighting in the concourses. And then we did our little PS1 beer carts for, you know, inside architects joke. And then the, the great part was that really sort of making the interior was all black seating. It was really about making it feel like a, like a black box theater, like a, a different kind of thing. It was very, it was boxing lighting and it was really about making a, a different kind of urban experience and it's, it's been very successful and we also helped, uh, guide them to changing the team's colors from red, white, and blue to black and white. Um, Cause we knew if New Yorkers were gonna wear it, it better be black. And they went from 26th in the league in sales to sixth in the league in sales in one year. Um, and as you can imagine, the architect totally profited off of that. <laughs> so. so how do you create meaning through context? Um, a building, literally I'm standing in front of Barclays in this rendering looking, looking uh, towards Manhattan. And so, um, there was one block in the city, there's two blocks in downtown Brooklyn that don't have a height limit on them, really, and, uh, and enough FAR. And our client came and approached us to look at this difficult site um, because the site, he couldn't get the entire block, he got about 80% of it, but it had a landmark bank on it, the Dime Savings Bank of Brooklyn, which was not only an exterior landmark, but an interior landmark as well. And then lot 100 that you see right next to it, there was... An, there was uh, about 500 or 600,000 feet of buildable FAR. So you could build a giant slab building behind and ob obscure the bank, or we would have to get uh, approval to build a landmark tower on top of it. Um, so we approached it by thinking, what could we pull out of the bank to be a driver for the tower's design? And the way that the original architects dealt with the, with the triangular site was through this combination of hexagons and six-sided stars. And so we kind of thought about that by sort of taking those, those uh, uh, shapes and control lines, bringing them across the building, and doing a tower that was a series of interlocking hexagons. And then one of the reasons we knew that this building would be, the, the way we saw it was gonna be the tallest building in Brooklyn by far. And in Manhattan where you have the avenues are primary and the streets are secondary, you always sort of know where the front of the building is. But in Brooklyn, all the grids are shifted and this was almost right at the middle of those shifted grids. And so we wanted to make a building that you couldn't really see where the front was. 
and that even though it was a residential building that needed to be mostly glass, we wanted a building that had a solidity to it. And so we thought about this idea of the interlocking hexagons and a facade that would make a glass building not feel like it was glass. So we looked at these ideas of crenellation in nature in the historic bank and, and how we could use it for contemporary architecture. And we had a color palette that went from black stainless steel to bronze to white, um, white uh, ceramic. And we abstracted hundreds of shapes from the, from the building itself. Literally, we must have made 500 to 1,000 different pieces. And we made these boxes, and we just started composing all the shapes back and forth, bringing light across them, photographing them, seeing how they would work, and use this as a kind of system for the facade of the building that would have a certain flexibility in it. And so this is, this is sort of what the facade would be like. It changes color as it goes from bottom to top. We had large scale models that were completely flexible. So as we were changing the interior, we could recompose the exterior of the building in and out. And the thing that it really does is by having this kind of deep facade material, because whenever you look at a hexagon building, you're looking at two facades in the oblique at all times. And by putting that thickness on it, it literally turns it into a solid, even though it's a glass building. And so that was really the objective of the building, um, is that when it turns the corner, it feels much more uh, solid. Um, and then it was this kind of abstraction of, of the dark building coming up. And as you can see, it's a little bit taller than its neighbors. Um, and uh, this building, we got it through landmarks in almost record time. The Landmarks Commission loved the building. Um, and then this is the interior of the bank, which is going to become the entrance and the retail space below. But we, this was the hardest part, was getting the base of the building to connect with the landmark. And so we were looking at the convex and the concave uh, fluting on, uh, on pilasters. And we said, what if we used a five-axis mill to do a five-story high convexicave uh, column, pilaster, which smoothly transitions from convex to concave? and then use those to wrap around the base of the building to connect to the bank below uh, next to it. And so Landmarks loved it. We got it through. Um, and then we opened up the bank. It had been closed by a 1940s sort of terrible office building for a long time. And then we put the amenities on the roof and put the swimming pool around the historic dome. So the historic dome of the building comes up out of the water, and you can swim around it. Um, this is a view from the South Street Seaport when it gets done. And from this is from Fort Greene Park and from the Barclays Center looking back. So this building's under construction right now. Uh, it'll be 1,180 feet tall. Um, and the tallest building in Brooklyn is about 700 feet. So it's really felt a, bit, a lot of responsibility for building a building that we know is going to be on the skyline for a long time. And feel incredibly lucky to have uh, JDS and Michael Stern as our client um, unbelievably supportive of this building. Why don't we let design connect us? How do we make those kinds of connections? On the East River waterfront, uh, it was a project that had really sort of been um, tried to, uh, 20, over 30 or 40 years, many architects tried to do something with this stretch of the island. Um, but it was pretty complicated uh, for many, many reasons. Seven different neighborhoods, lots of, uh, lots of infrastructure that needed to be handled. But we really got involved in the political process here. But this is what the site looked like. You had um, you know, infrastructure sort of really like blocking the way you can move through it, even though this is some of the only south-facing waterfront property in Manhattan, uh, which in any other city would make it the most valuable property in the, in the city. It was used for garbage piles and truck parking and salt pits and all kinds of stuff. Um, there were places where there were up to 14 layers of chain link fence between where people lived and out to the river. And so um, we, we just sort of did a strategy where we said, look, if we take away the truck parking, if you plant a tree wherever you can get to real soil, if you can get the bike lane to connect the bike lane through it that goes all the way around Manhattan. And then we had an elevated highway in the middle of the park. And we said instead of which we couldn't take down for various reasons, Instead of seeing that as an, as an encumbrance, why don't we think of it as a free roof? And why don't we put public program and commercial program and, and, and community programs in a series of pavilions underneath the FDR Drive? And, so, and then if we ever get control of any of the piers, 
let's make them double-decker piers where you could have maritime uses on the lower level, you could have passive uses on the upper level, and you could have revenue-generating pavilions in the middle of the sandwich that help maintain the park. Um, so we won the competition to do that. We won a second competition to actually draw it. And it was tricky. We had to build up the soil because a lot of it was on decking. We had to work with this uh, piece of infrastructure, the raised highway. And so <clears throat> we, we worked on it for almost seven years to get it done. And um, the first phase opened about five years ago. Um, but you could see the, the esplanade as it worked out. We developed um, uh, the system of furniture uh, for, the, for the project. Um, the ductile concrete is made here in Charlottesville, I believe. So we're very excited about that. And we've, um, uh, one of the things that was really important also was the railing, a kind of railing that you could connect to. And so, you know, typically a railing sits right in your eye level uh, when you're on a, the 42 inch required height limit is right w where you want to look out and see the water. And so we developed these sort of bar seats and this thickening of the railing to sit on there. The, by far the most popular seats in the entire park. And, you know, figured out how to push the plantings under the FDR. Um, you could see the sort of, you, there's never direct light on you. It always bounces off another material. And so you see this sort of lavender light that we painted the girder of the FDR lavender. And then there are places where it breaks down where the historic slips once were to get you closer to the water. And then the first pavilion got put in. It's, it's now a, a restaurant. Um, this was space that we, it was all designed to sort of deaden the sound of the, of the traffic above you. This was space we fought with the city for years about, they said, who would ever want to be in terrible space like that? And we said, no, you can actually make it great. Um, and so here you can see it's, it's super popular. The whole facade opens up and spills out onto the, onto the esplanade, but you don't even, you're, this is, you're inside, you're underneath the highway and you have no idea. So it's really found space for the city itself. And then the double decker Pier 15 um, with an educational facility and uh, another uh, bar at the far end and ticket booths for, for um, uh, maritime cruises um, with this sort of glowing red roof. And then the sort of passive recreation these glass boxes have green roofs that become the lawns on the upper level that you can sit on. And here you could see uh, the glass pavilion below and the green roof above and um, how that all spills out onto the edges and it's, it's wildly successful. And then the final part of this is this was the old Rouse uh, Pier 17 building. So this part of the project was under lease to a private owner for another 80 years but it was really a kind of failure as a, as a project. And it was really about the fact that it didn't connect very well. So you had the fish market used to be in these two buildings that you see here, the tin building and the market building and on this side, but the, the market was gone. The buildings were dilapidated and the whole design of this was, you know, the festival marketplace was about hiding the fish market and the real grid of the city from the tourists that sort of went in and went out around the outside. And you know, it was an interior-oriented shopping pavilion on a waterfront, probably not what we would do today. And so our whole idea was use the pavilions under the FDR, extend the street grid of Manhattan out onto the pier, and then lift the building up so it's a series of pavilions out there where there's actually no front door. You walk through it like a series of streets. And that you could connect all of the retail uh, from the Fulton Market to the FDR Drive, relocate the tin building so you could lift it out of the floodplain, and then put a flat roof on top of Pier 17 so that you have a 60,000 square foot uh, public park for everyone to use that's open at all times. Um, and so this was the idea of the programming of the roof of the park. And then uh, it's just nearing completion uh, right now. So. You can see there's a series of, of two-story pavilions underneath and then on top of it, this sort of large pier building, if you will. Um, we use the kind of morphology of, of, of the industrial pier, but it's all in a kind of channel glass. And then we have these large-scale pier doors. They're 32 feet high by 20 feet wide. So the building, as I said, doesn't have a front door, but you can drop these down just to block the wind enough as it comes up the harbor. Uh, so that you can use it, uh, uh, you know, 12 months out of the year. Um, and then we wrap the esplanade around the edge. 
The materiality is, is all teak and corrugated zinc, so kind of waterfront materials. Um, and then wherever you are on the inside, you always have unobstructed views of the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge. So there's constantly this connection between what's going on in the river. We even cut part of the building back and the river flows in like a slip right into the, into the building. Um, and here you can see that's before the facade went on, but the idea of it, of it glowing and being this kind of lantern on the, on the, on the river right now. So it'll probably open by Christmas of, of next year, but it's been uh, a pretty amazing project and the, the roof is really gonna be a fantastic public amenity for the neighborhood. We do some smaller projects too. Um, this was a pavilion that we did for the Milan Furniture Fair. Um, we got one of the courtyards uh, right near the fair and one of the universities. And while this all looks like Renaissance architecture, it was really 19th century terracotta, fake to look like it was Renaissance architecture, um, which we loved. And we looked at how they made it and their repair shops for it. And so we used that as our kind of context uh, for, for this pavilion for the fair. And so we, we looked at the way in which um, could we use the computer to control the manufacture of terracotta extrusions. And so these were some of the test pieces. And it really became this idea of a, we called it the wave cave, this sort of undulating uh, shape or form uh, of the extruded terracotta. And so here were some of the models and figuring out how to make it uh, self-structured. Um, and so by putting it again in a hexagon pattern, it not only became these kind of beautiful elements, but really then also had its own structural integrity. And so uh, there you could see the pavilion at the night of the opening of the fair. But it was uh, very simple to make and very simple to, to assemble um, um, the 2,500 parts. And here you could see the pavilion with the cuts on the inside and then what that looked like as you came up to it. And so the, the, again, the idea was that it, it was sort of a wave this year and then the idea was that we would flip next year, we would flip it over and it would become a cave. So the same pavilion could be used two times. Um, it didn't exactly work out that way, but it's close and we're gonna, we're gonna remake it as a cave too, but we tried. Um, but then it, it lit up at night and again, this was just a very simple play of, of a lot of the materials that we've been using. Again, using technology with these historic materials and seeing what we could do. And you know, a lot of the projects that we work on take five, eight, 10, 12 years. And this was amazing because we did it in two months. Um, and so it's really important, I think, to do quick, fast projects as a designer, as well as the sort of longer ones that you, that you need to work on um, over a long time. And then that would be what it would look like when it's the cave um, next year. Um, and then you get a project like this. Again, this was an international competition to do a, an innovation hub, a government complex in, in Gaborone, Botswana, the capital. Um, this is a project we won in 2009, still under construction. Um, but taking this idea, it was really, the, Botswana is an amazing country, stable democracy for 40 something years, um, very little political strife and, and um, really kind of, they have a great educational system and they're very smart. They know their diamonds are going to run out and so they're taking what wealth is left and they're seeding new industries. And so they said, build us a complex that's going to inspire the next generation of, of Botswanans to, to be creative and it's going to attract people from the West to come in and invest in our country. And so the idea was the two main sort of forms in, in, in Botswana landscape are the dunes and the deltas. And it was this idea of a kind of striated uh, building that you could add to, but also to create these sort of microclimates that allowed these beautiful historic trees that were on the site to, to, be, to have the building built around them. And so the notion was to, instead of having a giant parking lot that you had to put shade on, to build the, par build the parking on grade, lift the building up, berm the landscape around it, and allow the trees to come up through the middle of, the, of these uh, courtyards. So this was the, the sort of rendering from the competition. We were fortunate enough to win it. Um, and here was the design of the building. So you can't even really see the cars parking. You just kind of slide in through the, through the grassy um, uh, landscape. 
And then the building, um, as we got it through uh, uh, construction documents, and then we looked at in, uh, methodologies of, of, of basket weaving and wrote scripts to test out all different types for the main public spaces, um, planted uh, a local tree, trees on the site and then used them, sent uh, um, CNC mills down to Botswana and they're actually making the, the material for the inside. These were the tests we did in the office in New York, but then this is what the, the, the public rooms uh, uh, interior walls will look like and it has all the HVAC and the lighting and everything embedded in them um, and that's sort of one of the spaces when you first come in. So this is all being fabricated in Botswana. Um, this is the field office down there and incredible knowledge transfer working with the local uh, universities. Um, the building is really a total reflection of dealing with the harsh environment and that's what generated all these overhangs and, and curves and, and fins uh, to make a building that was sort of open, iconic, but performed incredibly well in the, in the pretty tough environment. Some of the final renderings. And then fabricating the facade, which is being done in South Africa. Um, we had to get the goats off the site to get the building going. Um, here you could see the, the, the concrete as it was being poured and the building rising. Here's the facade going on, and this is sort of a more recent photo. But to, to build a project like this here, this was maybe about four or five months ago, so it's getting really close. But to, to be able to build, you know, it's one thing to build these super complicated projects with, with all this technology in a place like New York or Tokyo or Los Angeles or London or Washington. It's a different thing to do it in Botswana. And... Um, but yet, it still, we controlled the budget, we controlled the means and methods. It's, it's been a, a slog through a lot of issues that are political, but it was really kind of connecting with the, with the local conditions and the local universities that allowed a project like this to happen. Um, and so it should be finished next year. And you know, again, what is all this technology really for? Is it, is it just to do the technology, or is it about making better buildings? And um, I know some of you who are in the studio have seen me talk about this building, so I apologize. Others of you who are in the studio, I gave a tour to this a couple weeks ago, but for those who haven't, I'll do it quickly. Um, these are the American Copper buildings that are built on First Avenue and 35th Street. Um, and so um, we had a, uh, a very difficult zoning envelope. There was a master plan that had done, been done before, about 10 years before, which put um, a school on the southwest corner and then a 48 story west tower and a 43 story east tower and then the FDR drive is there on the right and then it put a park on the northeast corner so that they could guarantee it would be in shade all the time so not the best master plan um, it also pushed the tower which is a double loaded corridor building up against the school so you couldn't have any apartments for the first nine stories besides that it was brilliant um, so what we had to do with this very restrictive envelope was the client said, what can you do with, because uh, I can't go through a rezoning on this, it's just too complicated. So we just did a, a couple of very simple moves. The first idea was we said, what if we took the standard developer plate and we inscribed the building from the sort of max here to the max there to the max there of the envelope? And what if we took the other building and did it the other way, the front to back? And then um, because there was this park that was required in the corner for the public, we said, what if instead of doing sort of two average amenity spaces for each one of the buildings, let's build it as a community because it's almost 800 apartments together. We said, what if we connected this with a bridge and made one phenomenal amenities package that went across that almost became a park for the people who live in the buildings? And then... The last thing was that the building was in the flood zone. And so we, we thought about how to deal with it. So there's a two-story underground garage that we did. It's a bathtub construction built basically in the mud of the river. And we designed it to flood. And it's designed to flood and then to pump the water out. We lifted all the mechanical space more than 23 feet off the ground. So there's no mechanical space in the basement. And then we thought to ourselves, like, we've now lived through three blackouts in New York in the last... 15 years and we said like in our experience like what do you need to sort of make it like so we were kind of like to survive so we were like 
if your if you know your, the elevators work, if your refrigerator works, and if you had one special outlet in your apartment that ran off a generator and you could keep your phone charged, you can live like seven to ten days in New York City and get by. <laughs> So that's what we did. We, um, we, put, we put massive generators on the West Tower roof, and we used the bridge as an extension cord. It freed up the East Tower roof to be also amenity spaces, but it also gave a kind of redundancy and, and safety factor to the building in case of another Sandy or, or blackout. Um, and so then the bridge sort of connected between the two buildings. And really, the trick was not the structural system. The trick with this project was the mechanical systems, because you can't put the mechanical lines in at an angle. It's not a big deal to put concrete up as an angle, but the mechanical lines always have to be perpendicular to the installation of the equipment. So it was really about stepping uh, all of the mechanical equipment up. So it was fully modeled in BIM, working with Bureau Happold and SHOP. And then we did the sort of north and south facades in, uh, in material, it ended up being copper, um, and that the patterning came from a sort of moire that comes off the point at which the bridge hits the two buildings, so using four different window sizes. Um, and then here you could see the renderings of the building with the two folded towers and the bridge connecting. Um, we ended up using a live copper, so it arrived as a super shiny penny, um, but you know we all love the copper of the Statue of Liberty, and so we left it raw and the buildings will turn green um, in front of, no one knows how long. We've heard everything from like 10 to 50 years um, to, to, to see it happen. But we think it's gonna be a kind of phenomenal performance art piece for the city as we, as we watch these, these copper buildings change. And then they were constructed. Uh, building the bridge was really tough. There hadn't been a bridge built in New York in a very long time. And you can see the buildings. This is looking from the Queens waterfront. And uh, the east and west facades are sort of curtain wall glass. That's the sort of better views are to the city and to the river. Um, interestingly, everyone thought people would want the waterfront apartments. The city facing apartments uh, are the ones that go first. So all architects should be happy. You're much more desired than nature. So. Um, and then here you can see the buildings uh, as, as they sit in the Midtown skyline. And then these are the interiors. Uh, we did it in collaboration with K&Co. Uh, the, own, the, the lead partner and owner of K&Co is here tonight, Kristen Inavaji. We're lucky to have her here. Um, and then the, my favorite part of the whole building is we put the swimming pool on the bridge so that you could swim from one skyscraper to the other and back um, on the glass. And then here you can see these are some climbing walls and some of the amenity spaces on the inside and what the buildings look like. So um, the first West Tower opened about 11 months ago. The East Tower is just finishing construction. People, they just opened the second lobby uh, last week. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been wildly successful. And this is a rental affordable, there's 20% affordable housing in this project. So to do it on that tight of a budget, a building of this quality is really remarkable. And, we feel very proud about it. So two last projects. Can a building embody the spirit of a city? So we were approached by Uber um, to look at two sites that they had bought in Mission Bay in San Francisco. And um, they wanted one singular building, but they couldn't get a site that was large enough. Um, and so it's just near where the new stadium is going to be built. We've been doing a tremendous amount of, we do a tremendous amount of work out in the Bay Area. Um, seems to be where a lot of our key clients are now. Um, but really about, about life, about the 24-hour the cycle, about work research. Um, and it's super interesting doing academic building. What we're seeing is that the academic buildings are moving more towards the, the uh, tech campuses and the tech campuses are moving more towards the academic campuses. And there's this sort of strange research that's coming out in this hybrid. And the third thing that we're seeing that's coming into it now is hospitality. And so actually a lot of hospitality design is feeding back in through the academic and through the tech campuses. And those three worlds are, are really absolutely blending at the cutting edge, um, connected with landscape and great public space. Um, and so we just thought about the sort of vertical city 
and this notion of turning the streetscape vertically in the building and to think about the office components and how it wouldn't be about flat floor plates but about floor plates that shifted up and down. Um, and then uh, it was really important to the CEO that, that basically the way that, that they like to do meetings is they take meetings by walking. And they, so a sort of peripatetic methodology of problem solving. And so they, they wanted these circuits almost through a park inside their headquarters where they could walk and talk and make strategic decisions. Um, and so that was what it was really about. How do you connect these two buildings that were in a kind of tough given zoning envelope and make it work efficiently? And, and then because it was San Francisco, um, we wanted these spaces to be outdoors because where the computers are, you've got to really control the temperature. But in all the meeting spaces, all the gathering spaces, all the walking spaces, we wanted it to be outdoors. Um, and so uh, we worked on it. It's also very tough to do an all glass facade in San Francisco now because of the energy codes. And so it was really about bouncing light down, having transparency through, and then having a, a basically the, you could see where the break is. All of this space is actually air conditioned and all of this space is outside. And the facade opens and closes based on uh, the localized weather conditions. And again, looking at the sort of materiality of the building, um, and here you could see uh, the proposal, um, and you could see the, the how the windows there, uh, fourteen foot tall bifold uh, bronze doors um, that all respond to the local weather condition and open and close, so that that space is constantly um, um, outside but temperate. And then what it does when it meets the street, and you're actually able to, from the street, look right up there's, and look right through that facade. So it's, it really kind of connects them to the public in a, in a different way and inside that thickness of that facade and what it would be like to be in those spaces and the building um, where the bridges are connecting. I actually, I, should, I didn't even realize this. I have to fix this slide. So we, we lost one of the bridges in the political process. <laughs> which is really a bummer because three always looks better than two. It always looks crappy when there's an even number. You always need an odd number, but that was all we could get through. Um, that only took a year. Um, and then the, this is actually all, this was already uh, last fall, but the building has topped out with the steel and it's, it's underway and in, in really good shape. Um, the last project I'm gonna show um, is 111 West 57th Street. Um, so this is also with JDS and Michael Stern, um, and this was a project we started about four years ago, um, and it was a really very, very tricky project. So there, there have only been three towers approved in New York City on top of historic landmarks. The first is Norman Foster's uh, uh, Hearst building. Um, this was the second, and Nine DeKalb is the third. Um, and so again, it was really about taught making a narrative about what this building was and its history. And we kind of looked back at, at the sort of fabric of New York that always had the sort of soaring tower and the low fabric. And that, that, that contextuality doesn't mean that it's the same height. In fact, that that's the worst idea for contextuality, that you want a heartbeat on the skyline, you want difference, you want, you want that sort of thrilling high-low. Element and we we also looked at like what are some of New Yorkers' favorite buildings, um, and it wasn't that the materiality or the style or the period. It was really the proportion that made people love these buildings. And and of course the proportion they're all pre World War II was m much of a function of getting natural light and not having air conditioning in these in these floor plates. So they needed to be narrower floor plates, and that created a kind of skyline that that we we are familiar with. And after World War II, it's a different kind of set of, of parameters. And so you get the larger floor plate, you have air conditioning, and you have American corporate efficiency. And we love these buildings too. It's not a, it's not a either or. Um, you know, obviously there are some that are spectacularly done and, and quite beautiful, but it's just a different kind of skyline. Um, but right now, there's a moment, there's a political and a financial and a strategic moment that's happening where there are so few, there's been so much down zoning, there's so few sites left in key areas um, that literally every last square foot is being bought 
and the technology is there to now make these super slender buildings, but it's not office as the use, it's residential as the use that can afford it. And it's really about getting the view of Central Park. Um, the, the, price of the, the price of the unit more than doubles, sometimes even triples, if it has a view of the park, the same exact apartment. So with the technology being able to, to, to deal with these super tall buildings, you've got you know, Nouvelle and, and, um, and Vignoli and Deportes and Park and a series of, of architects who are doing these, these last buildings. And you know, it's been, it's been, it's been you know, in the news that it's gonna create a wall in front of Central Park, but it, it's not true. It's literally grabbing whatever's left. And once these are built, there's no more FAR left. And by having them as these taller, slender buildings, they actually have less of an impact on the park with the, the time that the shadow goes across uh, during the day. And I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkable moment um, in the city that these eight or 10 will get built. Um, and so you know, our footprint for the majority of our tower is only 60 by 80 feet. So it's 60 by 80 by 1,428 feet tall. So it, for those of you, if there's any engineers in here, you know, anything over a one to 10 height to width ratio is slender. Anything over 15 to one is, is extremely slender. Um, anything over the, the sort of most slender buildings in the world now are around 17 or 18 to one. And this building will be 23 and a half to one in its slenderness ratio. So it's, it's quite a, but it's actually not that different from the Chrysler building which is 90 by 90 in the, in the main part of the shaft. And, um, and the building is being built uh, as part of Steinway Hall where Steinway pianos were built um, and sold for many, sold, not built, they were repaired there, um, which is a Warren and Wetmore building, the architects of Grand Central Station, uh, fantastic, fantastic uh, building. And it had, we, our client bought the vacant lot and so we could have built on the vacant lot next to it, but it would, again, obscure the beautiful uh, tower of the Warren and Wetmore building. So we went to Landmarks and we said, let us build on top of it, but slide it behind. And we can celebrate that tower and push the building, the, the main part of the tower away from the street, which they agreed. It's a retail base. We removed every other floor out of the historic building in order to get higher ceilings in the base. Um, and then we started to think about the tower and the, obviously the, the, the very well-known Hugh Ferris drawings, but this notion of the setback. And we said, look, the historical setback was these kind of large pieces. The contemporary setback is the sort of slope plane of glass, like the Bank of America building um, or the, the Louis Vuitton building. We said, what if we did a sort of hyper-articulated feathered setback? where it had you know, 20 or 30 setbacks on a single building that could go up in an arc where each pilaster would be a setback in and of itself. And then we said, let's put all the structure in the east and west facades and leave the north and south open. So the north looks at the park, the south looks at the skyline. And basically you have one apartment per floor um, with a double stacked elevator system. So we only needed two shafts so the elevator opens up for passengers into the apartment and opens up from the back for the service and repair um, and support. And you have these super large, it's the, basically the structural system is a giant H in concrete. Um, and that's what, that's what gives it its, its lateral stability. And so we were gonna have these sort of very thick, heavy walls on the east and west facades, on these shear walls. And so we thought about, you know, again, both the contemporary, the historic material, but using it in a contemporary way, thinking about how to fabricate and manufacture it, thinking about the political implications, and came up with this idea of a kind of custom terracotta that would twist up and twist as it goes up the building so that when you look at it on 57th Street, um, you would get this kind of texture and patterning. So we did 26 different shapes of terracotta in six different colors. And when you look, so that's basically a solid wall with very small windows punctured into it, which is the structural element. But as the sun hits the building from the south, it gets this light and shadow pattern with this building coming up to and, and, and diminishing to just eight feet wide at the very, very top in the, in the, in the crown. So again, you could see there was a sort of um, cast bronze filigree in between these elements. 
And here you can see the rendering of the facade as it goes up, all digitally fabricated. And here's the building going up right now. The facade's just started to go on. Um, and you can see the, the pieces. And then to the park where you have your living room, um, we, it's all glass um, with a sort of inset of bronze. Uh, we worked with Bill Sofield on the interiors. Um, so this is your 60-foot living room on the park, clearly part of our mayor's affordable housing initiatives. <laughs> and, um, and then the top 200 feet is an um, a 850-ton tune mass damper and then a 200-foot sculpture of glass and bronze that will light up on the skyline. Looking from the park, here you can see the top. And this was uh, at the end of last summer. Um, here you can see the building go up. I think some of the UVA students got to visit it and go up on the building two weeks ago when they were in New York. Mona, you said it was very comfortable going up on that building. So um, here you can see the facade going up. And you know, it was, it was really important. You know, we, we thought the client was amazing because we thought about this and we said, look, it's, it's only 60 apartments, the whole building. And so, you know, we said, look, 60 extraordinarily wealthy people, families are gonna live here, you know, but eight million of us have to look at it every day. And we said that to the client, we said, you have to spend at least as much on the outside as you do on the inside. Because the, and the, the client said, absolutely, you're right. And by being strategic, by getting it through landmarks fast enough, we got it through in only four months, and that saved probably tens and tens of millions of dollars on interest payments for what it would have taken anyone else to get it through. And he poured every cent back in into the building, and not one piece was value engineered through the whole process and what the building will look like uh, when it's done. So we just passed 600 feet. We're, we're now taller than the 9 West 57th Street over there. You can sort of see over most of the buildings, and we just have 800 more feet to go. So it's um, a little bit terrifying. But, um, you know, in conclusion, I just think it's, it's, it's an amazing time to be an architect. Um, you know, cities are so important to, to cultural and economic and equity issues. Um, you know, we've got to live in denser and denser environments if we want to protect the planet. We have to design places that we have to design density connected to mass transit. You know, all the technology, photovoltaics, anything it might be, these are a tiny, tiny element. The most important thing is to build smaller, denser, sharing our resources, connected to mass transit. But if you're gonna live in places like this, it makes architecture even that much more important because you need to invest in great public space. You need to invest in great buildings. One of the most sustainable things that you can do is, is design buildings that people love, that they don't renovate every 20 years. And, and that they take care of, and that are made in beautiful materials that don't need to be constantly replaced, but that can age gracefully and patina beautifully and can inspire us every day. And so there's this conundrum of building density, building urbanly, urbanistically about, and if we can use the technology and, and architects can get more and more involved in the financial side, in the political side, in the technological side, you can actually make these buildings. You can make these spectacular, beautiful buildings. You can make this great space. And I truly believe we're, we're at a moment where we are getting a place at the table once again. And for the students in this room, you're, you're in school at an amazing time. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we were beating our heads against a wall talking about these technologies as being the future. And now it's accepted, you know. And people are willing to try and invest and and, and use these technologies to help us solve a lot of the problems. So, um, like I said, it's a, it's a great time to be an architect. It's, a, it's an important role that we play as we go forward. And, and the most important thing is don't listen to the AIA and, <laughs> and, and get your hands dirty, take risks, try out new things. There's so many, you know, architects are, we're amazing. We're good at such a wide variety of things. Why did we say we were only good at making the image of a building? And why do we give up all those territories over the previous decades? And, but the, this shift in technology is giving us this moment, this chance to grab a lot of that territory back. And, and as long as 
we're doing that not for the pursuit of economic gain, but for the pursuit of social good and beautiful buildings and great spaces, then I feel incredibly lucky to wake up every day and be an architect. Thank you very much. Do you, do you want me to answer some questions? Am I being recorded? <laughs> I am. Oh. You're not distributing. Okay, you're not distributing. <laughs> okay. Look, I mean, the truth of the matter is, they're going to sue you anyway. So our 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 way of dealing with it was get involved yourself. Be don't like just try to solve the problems with your client and with the contractor all the way through. Be able to have incredible transparency among all the participating parties, help organize that information, and solve the problems when they come up. And if you do that, they don't sue you. It ha because they see you as being on their team, not, not the way the AIA document is set up where it's the owner, the contractor, and the architect, and the idea is to make them fight. That's a diagram not made by architects, that's a diagram made by lawyers, so that they're insured of having business for the rest of their lives. So if you fold that, if you fold that diagram and you start to take on these other risks, we actually see it as less risk. And, and I mean, we've been sued like two times in 20 years and they were both slip and falls when we had designed it perfectly correctly. So, I mean, I think that's the testament. It's like by taking on the more risk, you actually mitigate it. You're letting me off the hook that easily. There's one in the back. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we, we actually joke with ourselves, like, we wouldn't know what to do if someone gave us a beautiful green field and said, design a building. Like, I don't even know what I would do. Like, it, 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 the first, that's what we do. We sit down and we figure out every, that's all we talk about for the first month. What are the constraints? What are the goals? What are the patterns? What are the systems around us? What are the politics? What are the technological parameters? What are the, the structural or the construction issues we have to deal with? What's a material that we haven't used yet that we'd like to do some research on? It's, there's like, all of that is discussed for a month, if not two months, before there's ever a, a, an idea about a, a shape, right? Or a, or a look or a feel or whatever you might wanna call it. So those things are just brought to the forefront right at the beginning. And the building, and, and also the, the feelings and views of things that we care about, that we research, the stuff I talked about there in conclusion, the things that the client is super interested in and having their company or their university or their, their tenants experience or their fans, and, and, and bringing those together. And to us, that's, that's the architecture, right? Like that, it's that synthesis of those. But it's, the parameters are never seen as a negative, they're seen as inspiration. And it's just how do we solve them? You know, we don't want to whine about like, oh, I can't build it because there's a highway going through it. Forget that. Figure out a way around the highway. You know, and that's just that's just an attitude that we have from day one. Sure.
Well, um, I think our building looks different than 432 Park Avenue. Um, I think that um, there was, a, you know, I, I happen to like 432 Park Avenue. I mean, I like the relentless modernist grid. I, I do. I think that that's a building that a lot of people don't understand. I think it was shocking. I do not like 157, the De Ports and Park building. I think it was a, a kind of not a very well executed building. I kind of like it now because our building is going to be right next to it. So we're going to look good for the next like 80 years sitting next to it. <laughs> Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think there's, you know, change always brings about fear. There's always misinformation. I mean, you know, people were like, there's going to be 200 of these and they're going to block, you know, Central Park will be in darkness forever. I mean, it was literally what people were saying. Um, just so you know, if you go back to primary sources, when all the mansions on Fifth Avenue were knocked down in the, in the, the aughts, the teens and the twenties of the 20th century, it's the same exact thing. 18-story buildings looming over Central Park are going to ruin the park. It's the same thing every time. So, and now everyone loves them. So I, I, think, I think it'll be time. I think it'll be the quality of the buildings, and I think it'll be people understanding that this isn't some kind of crazy onslaught that's going to, you know, there's going to be 100 of these. These are going to be some very, very special buildings built at one time um, and will be written about by uh, future historians as a moment in, in the city's trajectory. So I think um, I'm still being recorded, right? Okay. So um, I think the NAAB needs to be uh, dismantled might be a little bit too harsh of a word, but completely uh, redesigned. I think it's training people to be architects for 1955. And, um, and I think that, uh, and I've been on accreditation reviews. I've advised deans in many schools. We've worked with Stanford in launching their new architecture program. It's really, really tough to make a great school when you have to follow those rules. And there are few schools that do it well, this being one of them, one of the very top. Um, you know, the, the, what is required, what the NAB is requiring and is not what we need. We need, and the way I would push it is like, you need way more theory classes you need way more technology classes, and then let the two meet in the design studio, right? But there's a lot of other history theory. Like, it's, there's a lot of other stuff that we don't really need to do. And, um, and I think that that's, I think that the design studio is still unbelievably relevant and unbelievably valuable. And I don't think there's a day at shop or a day when I go in against a hostile public you know, public uh, community group or a bunch of vicious developers, you know, with like red meat in their teeth and bankers who want to like discredit us and whatever, where I'm like, this is, this is just like studio, this is no big deal. <laughs> so, and, and the fact that you're forced, you're forced to think on your feet, the, you're, you're forced to be able to communicate and present and all, like all that stuff. That is unbelievably valuable, and I will forever be grateful for my architectural education. But we need to we need to push it forward, and it's got to go more to the periphery to make the middle go forward. If that makes sense. So, so uh, in terms of all of the things that you learned uh, in relation to not the uh, technology on the making side, design to making and fabrication. And how they do, how we do not teach how we have to take th I don't even know how we have to take three semesters of charcoal drawing and no one ever teaches a finance class is is inane I mean it's just it's bananas right like and it's not that hard guys I went to business school business school is not that hard it's like 60 vocabulary words and using Excel really well like that's all it is 
but we make but we make it into this big scary thing, and it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Even and uh, you know even the pro practice class like at Columbia, it wasn't helpful. It wasn't helpful. Like, tell me how to get a credit line. Tell me how to pay taxes. Tell me how to be strategic about that stuff. Tell me about putting proposals and pricing jobs. Tell me about treating people well as my employees, not this uh, you know Lord of the Flies management technique that so many of our heroes, you know, supposed heroes use. Right? How do you be a good boss? How do you manage people? How do you make people feel empowered? Right? Like how do I how do I deal with with deadbeat clients who won't pay? Right? That's when you can use the Lord of the Flies mentality. <laughs> Take the shell and hit them on the head. But the, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, that stuff, like, and it's not that big a deal. It's like one class, one really well taught class. And just like the technology, it's not that big a deal. Just use it every day in the studio. Make everyone have to use the technology. Just, it shouldn't be such a separate thing. It should just be, it's another May line. It's another triangle. It's another inking pen. It's another kind of paper. It's it's another chipboard model. It's just that's all it is, and don't be afraid of it. And just get your hands dirty and use it, and it works. I think we should end on that. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you so much.